In this video, we'll discuss Greek mathematics starting at the turn of the millennia. Now, one of the more famous mathematicians of that time was Hero or Heron of Alexandria. He was known to have taught at the University of Alexandria and focused more on application than theory, and that helped move forward concepts in engineering and land surveying. He put out a book called Pneumatica, which had many different inventions that are the foundations of some of the things we have today. For example, syringes like we use in medicine and also syringes used to push different fluids. He created the first fire engine, which was a pump to pump water and fight fires in cities. Uh, the alio pile was a form of a steam engine that hadn't been constructed before, although it's not the foundations of how we make steam engines now. And then the diatrapa here was used to actually do land surveying. And then the other kind of cool thing he made was a coin-operated vending machine to, that would dispense holy water for the people. Now, he also did mathematics as well. And one of the things that we know that uh, he gets credit for is the area of a triangle. Now, the concept of how to determine the area of a triangle was likely discovered by Archimedes, but Hero went through and actually put together the, theor the, the theorem behind why this works. So in his method, Unlike how we think about the area of a triangle, he would say that the area is equal to the square root of s times the quantity s minus a times the quantity s minus b times the quantity s minus c, where that s value is one half the perimeter. So say we have this triangle here, uh, that's a 3, 4, 5 right triangle ABC, and we want to calculate its area. So I did this to make it a little bit simpler for how we could calculate this. Now, if we look at what is the perimeter, that's 3 plus 4 plus 5, and then we're going to take that half of that value. So 12 divided by 2 tells us that the perimeter, half the perimeter would be 6. Now we're going to use the 6 and then plug it into Hero's formula. So 6 times 6 minus 4 times 6 minus 3 times 6 minus 5, that will give us 6 times 2 times 3 times 1, which that's the square root of 36, which is... 6. And if I think about how we calculate the area, 1 half the base and the height where we got the perpendicular, uh, we have 3 times 4 is 12, 12 divided by 2 is 6. Now another mathematical concept that comes from Hero is how to approximate a non-perfect square. And for his method, it actually becomes quite accurate very quickly. Here you take your number r and you split it into a two factors. And they have to be natural numbers to make this work easily. The first approximation would be the average of those two numbers. That doesn't get you but so far. But then where Hero made his, his big jump was the idea that for every iteration thereafter, if I take my previous value, add that to the original number I'm looking at divided by that value over 2, that will get me closer and closer to my square root approximation. And you can do this over and over and over again. So let's look at the idea of taking the square root of eight out three iterations. Let's start with what is two factors that are natural numbers of eight? Well, let's use four times two. The first iteration is just the average of those two numbers. So the average of four plus two over two would be three. So six divided by two is three. Now we're going to use that value of 3 in the new approximation, and we're going to do it twice. So if I take 3, and then I do 8 divided by 3, and then I'm going to put that all over 2. That becomes 17, 6, which is 2, and then 8, and with the repeating 3. Now that is getting much closer to the square root of 8. I'm going to do that a second time using the 17, 6 this time, because 17, 6 is closer to the answer than 3. So I use the same formula. So 17, 6 plus 8 over 17, 6 divided by 2 gets me to 577, 2 hundred fourths, which gets me a much, much longer decimal. And if I look at that compared to the approximation on a calculator, I would get 2.8284. I've already gone four decimal places, and I'm not that far off on my fifth one, showing how good of a method you could do, and they didn't even have calculators. Now also at the turn of the century, we have Menelaus, who continued on the works of Hipparchus around the concepts of trigonometry. His three-book uh, treatise on Spherica provides a lot of the insights into how the Greeks were treating trigonometry at that time. And he focused especially on the idea of the sphere and spherical triangles to start in his first book, 
just like we think about Euclid and what Euclid did for triangles in the elements. Then his second book focused primarily on astronomy and propositions in astronomy, whereas the third book then took all sorts of concepts of spherical trigonometry well beyond just the triangle. Also, Claudius Ptolemy is known to have created the, the Algamist, which was also based off the writings of Hipparchus. And he created 13 books, which is considered the longest scientific text in history, and was the primary work used in astronomy until Copernicus and Kepler, which were well over 1,300 years later. So it was a very, very strong piece of work that was used for a thousand, over a thousand years. Within this work of 13 books, we see both astronomy, mathematics, trigonometry. Uh, the table of cores was used to help with the astronomy. And then we have spherical astronomy. He was able to look and calculate aspects of the sun, the moon, planets, stars, all sorts of aspects that tied both mathematics to science and actually helped to show how astronomy could be considered a science of that time. Now, in his first book, we get a concept that we actually teach in geometry today which is that in a cyclic quadrilateral, the product of the diagonal's measures is equal to the sum of the products of the two pairs of opposite sides measures. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at a cyclic quadrilateral. Here we have cyclic quadrilateral B, C, D, E in circle A. And what that means is if I take my opposite sides D, E times C, B, and I add that to D, C times E, B, that will equal the product, the diagonals, C, E, and D, B. Let's look at an example to see how this would work. So say that in circle A with cyclic quadrilateral C, D, E, B, uh, we say that C, D is 5, D, E is 8, E, B is 10, C, B is 11, and D, B is 12. And we want to determine what is that diagonal C, E. So let's label all of our parts, and we're going to use our formula here. And what we get is that we do 8 times 11, opposite sides, plus 5 times 10, will equal 12 times CE. So we're going to simplify our left-hand side here. 88 plus 50 equals 12 CE. Going to then divide by 12 to get that it's 23 halves, or 11 and a half will be the length of CE. Now, when we look at algebra, because we focus so much on trigonometry and geometry, algebra was being completed at that time. For much of the early uh, prevalence of algebra, it was done as a rhetorical algebra. This meant that it was done primarily in pose. Uh, it did not use symbols and abbreviations like we think of today. And honestly, the rhetorical algebra remained the primary method in much of the ancient civilizations up until about 1400 CE in Western Europe. And then we see a change. Now, at the same time that rhetorical algebra is being used, though, there are places that syncopated algebra starts to become more common. Uh, and this happens with the Greeks at one point as well. Here, we start to use some abbreviations that help to set up the idea of, of um, connections to use an abbreviation for a quantity or an operation. And this is what helps transition us to symbolic algebra. But it was not consistent when we look at time periods or across the world. However, as we get into the 15 and 1600s, symbolic algebra starts to become more prevalent. Here we're using symbols and notations that don't have connections directly to the entities, but they do help us to solve the problems and then we can tie them back to what was the original situation in which we're dealing with. This is the type of algebra that we now deal with today. So one of those important figures from the Greeks was Diophantus of Alexandria. He's considered the father of algebra because he helped push the Greeks from that rhetorical algebra into syncopated algebra. And it was much of his works. And his book that helped push the most was Arithmetica, which was 13 books with over 130 problems and solutions. Often they were considered to be problems that could be done uh, with relatively simply in your head because they were focused on first and second degree equations. Uh, so uh, pretty much linear and quadratic equations at the time. The answers that he often considered were single solution problems and that the answers had to be positive rational numbers. Uh, that's why nowadays, even though he did not coin this term, uh, Diophantian equations are considered polynomial equations that allow the variables to be integers only. So that takes it even more restrictive than what uh, Diophantus would have allowed. 
So we don't know as much about Diophantus as we may want, but we there find in the Greek anthology from 600 CE a, a, a measure, an epitaph for his life that talks about how old he was. And it says that here lies Diophantus, the wonder behold, through art algebraic, the stone tells how old. God gave him his boyhood one-sixth of his life, one-twelfth more as youth, while whiskers grew rife. And then yet one-seventh, ere marriage begun, and five years there began a bouncing new son. Alas, the dear child of master and sage, after attaining half the measure of his father's life, chill fate took him. After consoling his fate by the science of numbers, for four years he ended his life. So how old was he? Well, let's think about what we know. We don't know how old Diophantus was, but we think about the parts to it. A sixth of his life as a, as a child. A twelfth in youth. Uh, a seventh before marriage. Five years before his son. And then half before he lost his son, and then he lived for four more years. So we have our equation. We can then simplify this. We're going to subtract that over to 1x, and we get 3 28ths. We will multiply both sides by 28 thirds to find that Diophantus was 84 years old. So that gets to some of that prose that we would see at the time that he was helping to push through to change that to syncopated algebra. Now, as we get to 300, we see that the, the reign of the Greeks in their, in their push, hmm, 84 years old. Now, as we get to 300, we see that the Greeks and their significant improvements in mathematics and science starts to draw to a close. However, there are still mathematicians and scientists that were trying to push the Greeks forward at this time. For example, Pappus was able to write commentaries on Euclid and Ptolemy's books and put together what was called the Mathematical Collection, which helped to show what was going on within the existing geometrical works of that time. And that's where we get a lot of our concepts and understanding of what the Greeks could do. Not only did it include improvements and extensions, it also had original propositions, which was important. So he was trying to push them back to focusing on, on improving their math and science. Additionally, in 400 CE, so about 100 years later, you have Theon and Hypatia in the Neoplatonic school, which is where uh, they continued to focus on their mathematics and science. And Theon helped construct what we consider our modern edition of Euclid's Elements with Hypatia, which allowed us to uh, know what was in those original elements, since there is no original copy of it. Additionally, Proclus constructed many different commentaries, which help us again get back to some of those works that maybe the originals are not there, but we could use and understand what was going on at that time. For example, he created other commentaries on Euclid, as well as commentaries on Plato's Republic. Now, Hypatia was the daughter of Theon, and one of her claims is to fame is that she is known to be the first female mathematician of record. She also taught at the University of Alexandria and was well renowned for the works that she did. She also wrote commentaries for Diophantus and Ptolemy. And she was just known to be a very strong mathematician and scientist. However, because of her pagan beliefs and the outspokenness of a woman at that time, a group of Christians eventually felt threatened by her and they took and brutally murdered her. With the fall of Hypatia also came uh, the close of the University of Alexandria, and you start to see the slow regression of the rest of the Greeks when it comes to mathematics and science uh, innovation at that time.